Well, let's turn together to Matthew chapter 6. We'll look at verses 12 and then 14 and 15. Matthew 6, verse 12. Uh, Very often in their writings, the apostles wish and they request grace to be upon the saints of God. We've been singing about grace this morning. Grace, that glorious aspect of God's nature that extends love to those who deserve no love, that extends favor to those who deserve no favor. And at the heart of grace... The, the center of grace is forgiveness. And as we're going to see, forgiveness is intertwined with prayer. And in our mini-series called How to Pray in Power, today we're going to examine the power of grace. Matthew 6, verse 12. Continuing in the disciples' prayer, And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And then the Lord gives a commentary on this. Verse 14. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. This shouldn't be taken as a prayer for salvation in Christ. The, The condition for salvation is not that you forgive others. And in fact, in true, until you've truly experienced the grace of God in forgiveness, you can't actually forgive others. Forgiveness is based in the grace of God. Humanity has no power to authorize the pardon of sin. We don't have that power. This is the forgiveness, though, that we see promised in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the relational, restorative forgiveness, or as some theologians explain, family forgiveness. That you're always part of the family of God as as one who has come to faith in Christ, but unconfessed sin, lack of repentance, harms your fellowship with the Lord. And so in that context, Jesus in this prayer is reminding us and he's asserting that it's wrong for you to request God's forgiveness when you won't extend it to others. Now, that actually opens up quite a can of worms theologically. It's my contention that this idea of forgiveness is not very well understood in the church. The first 18 months that I pastored here at Grace Bible Church, I preached on forgiveness eight times. I was trying to really drive these nails deeply. This is a a foundation that a, a church that believes the gospel must have. Just a couple of years ago, I preached on forgiveness fairly extensively, and this text in Matthew 6 reminds me that it's time to look back at those concepts. Many of you weren't here, and yet it's such a foundational part of understanding the gospel. Forgiveness is at the heart, it's at the soul of what it means to live the Christian life. But neither can we reduce it to a couple of platitudes or cliche sayings. We can't just say, well, Jesus was forgiving, so you have to forgive everyone. That that doesn't work. Like most doctrinal concepts, it takes a full-orbed understanding of Scripture to put together a reasonable theology and understanding of forgiveness. Now, our topic today is prayer, and we will return to that at the very end, and we'll do so meaningfully. But I want to take us down a path to be reminded of some of the most important biblical concepts concerning forgiveness because you need to know these concepts to get what Jesus is telling you to pray. So we're going to wander away from Matthew 6 for a while, and I want to have you go with me to Ephesians 4, a very familiar text to us. Ephesians 4, 31. I I consider it one of the most important texts in all the New Testament for us as Christians. We go there frequently. We never really satisfy our need to plumb the depths of these verses But I'm going to cover basically four areas that help us understand the theology of forgiveness. I want you to be well grounded in this. The first area is the difference between unforgiveness and bitterness. The difference between unforgiveness and bitterness. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath and shouting and slander be put away from you along with all malice. 
Instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, graciously forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has graciously forgiven you. Now you notice that the beginning and the end deal with the internal matters of the heart. Bitterness and anger and wrath are internal attitudes. Verse 32, tender-heartedness is an internal attitude, and this internal attitude includes forgiving one another. Now, here's why we have to carefully define terms. In this particular case, it would be very easy to make an incomplete theology of forgiveness by making the common mistake of building a theology on one passage or one verse. When we talk about forgiveness, theologically, it's used in two forms. First one we might call the attitude of forgiveness. The attitude in my heart. This is internal My attitude toward another, I need to forgive that person. That's the usage here in Ephesians 4.32. It's parallel to tender-hearted. And it's a command. Let all bitterness be put away from you. The first way we use theologically the idea of forgiveness is that internal attitude. But the second way is the restoration of a relationship. The restoration of a relationship. And this is external. So if you want to make it easy to remember, there's internal forgiveness, there's external forgiveness. That is, externally, the the reconciliation of unhindered fellowship. We even use this phrase, there's something between us. Forgiveness in relationship says that we're removing that thing that is between us and now there's nothing between us. This is very different than the internal heart attitude. I want to make sure we don't mix those up. We want to be as precise as we can in defining these terms, fully understanding that forgiveness has two connotations, internal and external. Bitterness, it's a Greek word that means internal resentment, that's a state of the heart which indicates hatred, it indicates malice. And the command against bitterness is very clear in verse 31. Bitterness, hatred, malice, they're never helpful, they're never justified, they're never okay. Every single use of bitterness, Greek word pikria, every single use of this word in the New Testament is in the context of it being sinful and wrong every single time. The purposeful cultivation of hatred, of malice toward another person is in essence the spiritual murder of that person. That's what Jesus taught in Matthew 5, 21 and 22. So this takes prayer. It takes a decision of the will to not let yourself go there. To say, Lord, this is always sinful. Bitterness is always wrong. Malice is always wrong. Thinking thoughts of hatred is always wrong. We can call bitterness the state of the heart, an attitude of unforgiveness. And that is wrong. That is sinful. You don't want to ever be in the place of viewing someone as unforgivable. Because that's what bitterness is. I view you as not being worthy of the forgiveness of God. Not being worthy of my forgiveness. But let's look at the other use of forgiveness. Forgiveness also speaks of not the state of the heart, but the state of your relationship. And so unforgiveness, when we think about that idea, is synonymous with broken relationship. And this is going to be shocking to you, but broken relationships are not wholesale condemned as wrong in the New Testament. They're not always wrong. And remember, we're building a theology, so if you walk out now, you're going to have a horrible view of this. Wait for all the pieces. In fact, there are examples of legitimate broken relationships in the New Testament. I could do many. I'll do three. Acts chapter 15. Paul broke relationship with Barnabas. There was a sharp disagreement between them, so they separated from each other. This was over the fact that John Mark was unfaithful. And Paul broke with Barnabas over this. It was a legitimate break. Another example. The Apostle John broke with Diotrephes and he intended to do so publicly. 3 John 9 and 10 describes this. Diotrephes was a leader in the church and John said, I'm coming and we're going to have it out because we are broken. And then the third example. The church is instructed to break relationship with the unrepentant. This means individuals in the church as well, not just the institution of the church. Matthew 18, 17, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. 
1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 11, Paul gives instruction to not even associate with the unrepentant who claims to be a believer in Christ. There is no lack of clarity there. 2 Corinthians 2, 6 and 7, Paul instructs concerning the same discipline situation in 1 Corinthians 5, that if this person is repentant, then there is to be restoration of fellowship and love. The, the church's discipline, if I could put it this way, is not some sort of time out that's not contingent on the heart change of the offender. I don't have time to go into all these, but I could cite Ephesians 5.11, 1 Thessalonians 5.14, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 and following, 1 Timothy 1.20, 1 Timothy 5, 19 and 20, 2 Timothy 3, 5, Titus 3, 9 through 11, 2 John 10. All of those texts indicate that there are times in which a broken relationship is the right thing. And the burden of proof is on the one who denies this to disprove each and every one of those texts because together they, they prove a formidable challenge to the idea that all relationships should be repaired at all costs. The Bible does not teach that. There's no denying the pain involved in broken relationship. But we live in a sinful world and it does happen at times. It doesn't mean that there can't be cordial and polite interactions, but there can't be closeness. There can't be intimacy. There can't be that which is characteristic of brothers and sisters in Christ until the Lord brings repentance. In fact, continuing to forgive a serious pattern of sin is like feeding a monster. And that's why church discipline involves the breaking of believer-to-believer relationship so as to drive the offender to repent, drive the offender to restore a relationship. And by the way, church discipline is not church little c that we discipline from Grace Bible Church. No, it's from the church big C that theoretically it should be disciplined from all of the body of Christ. That's the point. Paul says we turn them over to Satan. You're not turning someone over to Satan if they simply go next door to the next church. That does nobody any good. It's not the idea in the New Testament. The discipline is from the body of Christ worldwide. It drives them to repentance. That's the whole point. So bitterness, it's a state of the heart. It's warned against as never being okay. Forgiveness, we could define as a state of the relationship and it may or may not be possible depending on the circumstances. Now I want you to keep that in mind as we keep going. The first area is defining forgiveness versus bitterness or unforgiveness and bitterness and so forth. Second area to consider, God's pattern of forgiveness. God's pattern of forgiveness. Verse 32. Graciously forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has graciously forgiven you. Now, lest we think that that's a a guilt trip, it's not. It is a theological statement. This is not saying, oh, you need to just forgive because that's what God does. God just forgives everyone. That's not what this is saying. This is saying you should forgive in the same manner in which God forgives you. You see the difference? It's not a sentimental guilt trip. It is instruction. When you ask the question, how do I forgive? You forgive the way God does. The forgiveness that God gives is based in what? In repentance. That's the message of the gospel. John the Baptist preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Jesus preached, repent and believe in the gospel. He preached in Luke 13, 3, repent or you will perish. Peter preached in Acts 3, 19, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. Paul preached in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, for godly sorrow produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world brings about death. This is airtight. There is no salvation without repentance. God never saves someone because he's a nice guy. Never. Now, praise the Lord, Romans 2, 4 says that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's the kindness of God that changes our heart to desire to repent. It's the Spirit's work that enables repentance, not the other way around. You don't repent so that the Spirit will work in your life. The Spirit has worked in your life so that you will repent. It's very clear from Scripture that forgiveness is based in repentance. What is repentance exactly? What is it? Is it the emotion 
of sorrow. Well, that can't be the definition, although sorrow is certainly involved. We just heard Paul say in 2 Corinthians 7.10 that worldly grief produces death. That it's possible to have sorrow over your sin and yet not be saved. Can we think of someone who was sorrowful over his sin? Sorrowful to the point of death, yet he refused to be saved. How about Judas? He was so sorrowful that he took his own life, but he wouldn't repent. In the Old Testament, the idea of repentance is primarily expressed by the Hebrew word shuv, and it means to to turn, to turn back or to turn around. It's a very physical word. It means I once was facing this way, now I've turned this way. It involves action that demonstrates change. This is why John the Baptist preached to the Pharisees, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Show your actions that your heart has changed. The New Testament idea of repentance enriches us even more. It's primarily expressed by the word metanoeo, and it means a a change of mind, that your loyalty has changed. And that's precisely what will send people to hell, by the way, an unfeathered, stubborn loyalty to your own sin. That you refuse to change sides. You refuse to stop being loyal to yourself. And so you put those two concepts, Old Testament and New Testament together. Repentance involves a turning, a changing of actions, and a change of the mind, a change of loyalty. Now, some who don't take time to think this through have said, well, that sounds like works-based salvation. Not at all. It is required for salvation that you change your mind about your loyalty to your sin. You can't say, I love my sin, but I'll love Jesus also. Those two don't mix. Once you've changed your mind about your sin with the help of the Spirit, what do you naturally want to do? You were faced this way towards sin. You loved it. And now you've changed your mind about it. It repulses you. You're not loyal to it. You don't love it anymore. What do you want to do? You turn away from it. You cannot turn to Christ without turning away from sin. You can't do it. Listen to how Jesus put it in Mark 2, beginning in verse 16. When the scribes of the, and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they were saying to his disciples, He is eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. And hearing this, Jesus said to them, Those who are healthy do not have need for a physician, but only those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, Jesus is making a point here. He's using hyperbole. He's using exaggeration. There's no one who's actually righteous. Romans 3 says this. What he's saying is, he didn't come to call those who think they're righteous. Why? Because if you think you're righteous, you don't believe you have need for forgiveness. And if you don't believe you have need for forgiveness, you won't repent. And if you don't repent, you can't be saved. He's saying, I can't forgive them because they don't believe they need it. They haven't changed their minds about their sin. So the forgiveness of God is based in repentance. There is no forgiveness without repentance. And I'm going to hit that even harder in a few minutes. And so now you know God's pattern of forgiveness. It's based in the shed blood of Christ for payment for sin. And now when Ephesians 4.32 4.32 says, graciously forgiving each other just as God and Christ forgave you. How does God forgive? In Christ, based on the repentance of the humbled sinner. And so when we forgive, we forgive as God forgives, based in what? Based in repentance. And in fact, to promote a forgiveness, remember we're talking about restoration of relationship that's devoid of repentance, is actually to promote a form of universalism. That anything other than repentance is the means to restoration, then now we've stepped outside of God's model for forgiveness. Rather than a model of humble sorrow and misery over the sin and pain one has caused, and as a pastor I've seen this all the time, oh, but he's such a nice guy, can't you just, can't you just say, love covers a multitude of sins? I'm going to get to that. No, you can't. We're not universalists. So we're going to keep building this theology of forgiveness. We've defined forgiveness, a state of the relationship, bitterness, a state of the heart. We've seen briefly God's pattern of forgiveness. Now, a third area, I want to talk to you about the faulty theology of penance. Faulty theology of penance. In this context, what do we mean by penance? Penance. 
what we're talking about is some sort of external act or, or series of acts that are meant to make up for or even pay for a sin that's been committed. Now, this doesn't necessarily include a desire to turn away from a sin or a sin pattern. It doesn't speak of an improved behavior, changed behavior. It's just, I'm paying a price for a recent behavior. The idea of penance can be traced back to the Roman Catholic Church. It is to do some sort of deed to make up for a particular sin. It has no reference whatsoever to the attitude of your heart internally. It's just a deed. We see this in Protestant churches all the time that use Christianized versions of 12-step programs such as Celebrate Recovery. All that is is a glorified penance program. It's not repentance. Now you might say, whew, I'm not Catholic, so I won't ever offer penance. Let me give you some subtle form of penance that Protestants do all the time. They're not legitimate substitutes for repentance. A display of emotion. A display of emotion might accompany repentance, but it can be a subtle form of penance or putting on a show that seems to demonstrate sorrow. And if you get really good at it, you expect your emotion to be received as repentance. It's not. An act of service. You're determining to make up for your actions by doing nice things for the offended person. Again, that might accompany repentance, but it's possible to do nice things and avoid dealing with the actual heart issue that's at hand. Here's something else that's penance. Gifts. Gifts. It's possible to give a gift or a series of gifts to try to make up for an offense or a pattern of sin. Uh, Listen, if you're trying to help a guy who's who's in a, a bad way with his wife, it's bad advice to tell a man to buy his wife a box of chocolates to try to make up for a serious sin. In fact, that sends the message that the man is actually concerned with about, with about what he feels, that he wants to feel better, not about how his wife feels. And you say, well, actually, that, that sounds a little unreasonable. Let's take it to the nth degree. Somebody has murdered your child and he comes and gives you a box of chocolates and says, sorry, what would you do? You would probably tell him what he could do with that box of chocolates in no uncertain terms because it's not repentance. Gifts are fine when accompanied by true repentance, a change of the mind, a change of actions, what you're going to endeavor to do differently. But gifts are offensive when they're not accompanied by repentance. What's our basis for that? In Isaiah 2, God said he's disgusted by the gifts of Israel when they won't repent. He wants nothing to do with them. They're not accompanied by heart-level repentance. Here's one more form of penance, time. Time. This is one of our most common Christian myths. Time heals all wounds. I would defy you to find one scripture that teaches that. Time does not resolve an issue because repentance never happened. It it might make the emotion of the issue decrease, but it doesn't resolve the issue. It's just time. And let me prove this to you. If time heals all wounds, then hell would not be eternal, right? Time does not heal wounds. Time does not heal offense. And really, the continued attempt to use penance to make up for sin can ultimately be the sign of an unregenerate person because they will not or cannot humble themselves to confess sin, to have a change of heart and a change of direction. Penance just says, I want you to feel good about me. It's a form of selfishness. Our relating to one another is based in God's forgiveness. So the crux of the issue is our fourth area. We've defined forgiveness, state of the relationship, bitterness, the state of the heart. We've seen God's pattern of forgiveness. We've seen the faulty theology of penance. But our fourth focal point, and I want to come back and hit this hard, forgiveness is based in repentance. And you say, I feel like you've been saying that a lot. You're absolutely right. And we're going to say it some more. I want to prove this to you with undeniable proofs. And I'm going to give you seven of them. Seven lines of evidence that forgiveness is based in repentance, not in the passing of time, not in giving gifts, not in performing acts of service or feeling or displaying emotion. The first line of evidence, I want to take us to Luke 17. Luke 17, turn with me there. We have an important and helpful text. Jesus is teaching his disciples and he shocks them 
with a teaching they're not used to. They've never heard this. Luke 17, verse 3. And they're, they're so shocked when he makes this statement that they cry out to the Lord, Lord, increase our faith. Luke 17, verse 3. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times, saying, I repent, forgive him. That's shocking to the disciples. Generally speaking, culturally, if you forgave someone three times in one day, you were considered practically apostolic. You were just incredible. And he says seven times, which just means endless forgiveness. Now, these two verses indicate that repentance should be followed up by very quick and immediate forgiveness, the restoration of the relationship. And the primary lesson in Luke 17 is that forgiveness should be very quick to follow repentance. The condition, though, is clear. If he repents, forgive him. This fits an exact formula in Greek known as a third-class conditional statement, which simply means if the first thing happens, then do the second thing. If the first thing happens, do the second thing. So the teaching of Jesus in this regard is clear. Forgiveness, remember, that's restoration of the relationship, is to be quick and gracious based on what? The genuine repentance of the offender. It's the second line of evidence. Repentance is not the same as saying, I'm sorry. It is not the same as saying, I'm sorry. There's nothing inherently wrong with saying, I'm sorry. And and you know the old joke. Someone says, I'm sorry. And the other person says, quit saying, I'm sorry. And the other person says, I'm sorry. I keep saying, I'm sorry. It can be speaking of sorrow. It can accompany repentance. But saying, I'm sorry, in and of itself, only communicates that I feel the emotion of sorrow. In fact, the first word, I am sorry. In some ways, it can be trying to get the focus on yourself. It says nothing about your offense. It says nothing about acknowledging what you've done to the other person. So if I'm sorry is accompanied by genuine heart change, if it's in response to something accidental or or unintentional, those aren't evil words, but neither are they a substitute for repentance. It could be, I'm sorry that you caught me doing this. That's not repentance. If you say, I'm sorry for the pain that I have caused you, and I know it's been in this way, this way, and this way, that's repentance. And here's what I intend to do about it. It's the third line of evidence. The biblical principle that love covers sin does not imply forgiveness without repentance. Love covers sin is not forgiveness without repentance. And it's been argued that verses like Proverbs 10, 12, lover, love covers all transgressions, Proverbs 17, 9, he who covers a transgression seeks love. 1 Peter 4, 8, love covers a multitude of sins. You might say, well, that's pretty firm that I should just restore the relationship whether repentance happens or not. Well, let me give you two angles to this. First of all, obviously you can make a choice to simply cover sin and move on. You, you have that option. And wisdom would dictate, for example, that when a person makes a snappy comment or is impatient, perhaps you just let it go for the sake of maintaining peace or showing grace. Wisdom would not dictate, however, that letting a verifiable and long-standing pattern of the same sin go, that's not loving to the offender. It's not helpful to the relationship. It doesn't mean you're trying to perfect the other person, just that a, a recalcitrant and an arrogant attitude toward a sinful pattern cannot be ignored. Nor can you compel someone to forgive, to restore a relationship based on anything other than repentance. I've seen this in the church of Jesus Christ. Well, you need to just forgive them, but they haven't repented. Well, Jesus forgave you. That's a lack of understanding of the two variables. Part of our sanctification is the regular process of repentance. We repent to God. 1 John 1, 9, that is the repentance of the believer for family sin. We repent to one another. James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to one another. Let me give you a second angle on this idea of love covers sin. A closer look at the context of those three main passages tells a different story. In the Proverbs 10, 12 example, the greater context is making the choice to not spread dissension by telling others about someone's offense. Offense. 
that the love covers the offense by not immediately making it public. In the Proverbs 17, 9 example, whoever covers a transgression seeks love. This is not speaking of unconditional forgiveness without repentance. It's the first half of a warning to not be a gossip and a slanderer, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. And in the 1 Peter 4, 8 example, love covers a multitude of sins. This is just a general proverb, a, a proverbial axiom. The text doesn't say if it's the love of God or the love of man, just that love covers sin. What is this? This is Peter asserting the doctrine of atonement, that love covers sin. The love of God covers sins based on the atonement of Christ and the subsequent repentance of the sinner, and the love of man covers sins based on the atonement of Christ and the subsequent repentance of the sinner. Or to put it as Paul did, forgive as God in Christ has forgiven you. None of those examples argue for a forgive a verifiable pattern of sin with no condition of repentance. Let me give you a fourth line of evidence. The very structure of church discipline is based in repentance and forgiveness. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 15, restoration to the church is based in repentance. The discipline described in 2 Thessalonians 3.14, and if anyone does not obey our word in this letter, take special note of that person to not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. And you say, oh, how rude is that to put him to shame? It's a Greek word that means so that he will turn or repent. It's meant to drive him back, not drive him away. It's a fifth line of evidence. Lack of examples of unconditional forgiveness in the New Testament. There's not one example of Christ exhorting believers to unconditional forgiveness, the restoration of a relationship. There's not one example of Paul exhorting believers to unconditional forgiveness. There's not one example of Peter and James and John and the writer of Hebrews exhorting toward this. And before I give the sixth and seventh line of evidence, let me, let me give you a warning. If your emotion right now is making this upsetting to you, your emotion is not a hermeneutic. It is not a Bible study method. We must go with what Scripture says, and you're in danger of saying what I feel is actually loftier than what the Bible teaches. It's not. Here's the sixth line of evidence. There are no examples in the New Testament of penance or gift-giving being a legitimate substitute for repentance. In fact, we have an example of this turning against someone. In Acts 8, we see the story of Simon the magician offering money to the apostles in exchange for the Holy Spirit and by implication for exchange for a right standing with God in exchange for forgiveness. He was rebuked soundly, Acts 8, 20, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. The only way a true heart of repentance is revealed is with words and actions related to the offenses. And here's a seventh line of evidence. Repentance is necessary in the Christian life for sanctification. It's necessary in the Christian life for sanctification. How do repentance and sanctification relate to one another? Sanctification may be defined as the Christian proactively working at Christ-likeness by the power of the Spirit. And we have this combined into one little statement here in Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, the Apostle Paul says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is working outwardly what God is working inwardly. A combination of human effort and divine help. In fact, in the sanctification of the Christian, the, the battle between the will of God and the will of the Christian is slowly being eradicated. It's the process of completely submitting to the will of God. And this is directly connected to Christian repentance. Repentance is the transition of the mind of the flesh to agreeing with the mind of Christ. It's the lifetime goal that ought to be progressing. You ought to be more and more sensitive to your own sin and therefore you repent more easily, more quickly. What does repentance look like? 
I want to give you six examples from Scripture. I want to make sure we understand this. The first one, the daily sins of life. The daily sins of life. I'm going to read from Luke 17, verse 3 again. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Now again, this is Jesus speaking more to the responsibility to forgive those who repent. But there's an assumption here. The assumption is that the repentance is genuine. I want you to know this here. The text here doesn't give the criteria doesn't give the qualifications of general, of genuine repentance. So this text isn't meant as a one-stop shop on easy, cheap repentance. It doesn't give us any details as to whether there's natural consequences involved with the repentance. This is more instruction about the gracious, soft heart of the one who is forgiving. So you can't use this text to teach that habitual sin has no long-term consequences. You don't see the rest of this conversation. He comes to you seven times, I repent, I repent, I repent. In the average day of being awake, that means every two and a half hours, somebody has offended you and come back and said, "I, I repent. You are to forgive. What you don't see is that hard conversation of, brother, I forgive you, but I don't trust you. And there's going to be a longer process for that. Forgiveness and trust are two different things. That's another topic. There's a second example. King David in Psalm 51. We don't have time to turn to these passages. King David in Psalm 51. This is his repentant confession after committing murder and adultery. He had need of mercy. The first two verses. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. He needed to be transparent and honest. Verse 3, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. This isn't a guy saying, Well, I've searched my heart and I don't think I've sinned. No, this is David saying, I can't get away from it. It's everywhere. He needed to acknowledge that the most offended party was God. Verse 4, Against you, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. He needed to acknowledge his sin nature. Verse 5, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. In other words, he's saying, this is no surprise, I'm a sinner. He needed to joyfully receive the discipline of the Lord. He says in verse 8, make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have crushed rejoice. This is David saying, you've crushed me in discipline. Make me rejoice through this. And he needed to recommit to a holy life worthy of imitating. He says in verse 13, Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. You know what? One of the greatest things you can say to someone that you're confronting who refuses to repent, you can say, let me give you 10 times in my life I've had to repent. David says now he can teach the transgressor. Here's a third example. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus in Luke 19 In Jericho, he was the chief tax collector, a man who had a habit of defrauding his fellow Jews in his employment by Rome. Zacchaeus was a small man who wanted to see Jesus and he famously climbed a sycamore tree. You probably learned a song about it when you were a kid. He wanted to see Jesus. And Jesus called him to come down and Jesus invited himself to the home of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Because Jesus knew the heart of the man. He knew what he was about to do. And Luke 19 tells us that when when Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house, he hurried and came down and received him gladly. Now, let me ask you this. What kind of tax collector, considered right up there with prostitutes and thieves, receives Jesus joyfully? Well, let's find out. Luke 19.8 says that Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord. The Greek word stopped means to stand. Whatever Zacchaeus is about to say is important because he stands. Luke's gospel makes sure that we know that he didn't wait until they were reclined at the supper table. He stood to make a formal announcement. And here was his formal announcement. Behold, Lord. He addresses Jesus as kurios, the master, the Lord. The half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Now, I'm going to take a moment and walk through this because this is phenomenal repentance. First of all, Zacchaeus did this publicly. 
outside in the very crowd of the people he regularly stole from. In fact, in the previous verse, the crowds around Jesus had seen that Jesus was going to be with Zacchaeus and the crowd grumbled. They murmured. They gossiped to one another. There, you, can, you can hear it in the movies when everybody's turning to each other blah, 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 and talking like, who is this guy? They didn't like him. Second of all, because so much of his wealth was ill-gotten gain, as they say, Zacchaeus immediately pledged to give half of his entire fortune to the poor in Jericho. And he had enough money, he was essentially going to eradicate poverty for a while. Third part that made this phenomenal, he didn't just desire to obey the law out of love for the Lord in the spirit of true repentance. He made sure that everyone would know that his repentance was genuine. This was not a private conversation. He made it extremely public. Now, what do we mean by this? Leviticus 6, verse 5, and Numbers 5, verse 7, required that in this situation in which somebody had stolen something from his fellow Jew, he was to restore what was stolen plus a 20% penalty. Zacchaeus just pledged a 300% penalty. And notice he says, if I have defrauded someone, this isn't Zacchaeus leaving himself an out. This isn't that lame apology. If I have done anything wrong, I apologize. It's not that at all. This is an assertion that he's defrauded so many people that he's going to have to go back and check all of his records. It'll take time and effort to clean up this mess. And, and, and the fourth thing that makes this re- phenomenal repentance, he uses present active indicative verbs. I give to the poor. I restore it fourfold. This can either mean a certain promise, but generally it means he's doing something right now. In other words, it's very likely that in anticipation and hope of meeting the Lord Jesus face to face, he already began demonstrating the fruits of repentance. He already was knocking on the doors of his fellow brothers and saying, I have defrauded you out of this hundred dollars. Here's four hundred. And I'm so very sorry. And I am repentant. And this is my proof of repentance. And how does Jesus respond? He says, today salvation has come to this house. Judicially, in the courts of heaven, Zacchaeus has been justified, not because he did good works, but because his repentance was real and it was verifiable. Now, although he was justified, the consequences of his sin would continue. It's been estimated that it would have taken months to go through all of his records and get everything straightened out. Here's a fourth example. The sinful woman of Luke 7. The sinful woman of Luke 7, she's the prostitute or sexually immoral woman who was standing behind Jesus at a dinner that Jesus had with a self-righteous Pharisee named Simon. The woman was overcome with grief at her own sin and, and her gladness at the forgiveness available to her by Christ. And so she wept and she she got Jesus' feet wet with her tears. And so she's wiping the, the, the tears off with her hair and anointing Jesus' feet with expensive, precious ointment. Her repentance was humiliating. Her repentance was public. Her repentance was emotional. Her repentance was costly. There was no holding back. There was no, not one iota of pride left in her. Here's a fifth example. Another repentant tax collector. In Luke 18, we see the contrast of a fake believer and the truly repentant true believer. Luke 18, 9, he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Jesus told of two men who went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee who prayed proudly, telling God how wonderful he is, an assertion that I am right with God. I've searched my heart and I can't think of a single sin. The other, a tax collector stood far away in shame. He wouldn't lift his eyes up to heaven as was a custom in prayer. He beat his chest in agony over his own sin and he was saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This is an assertion, I am not right with God. Jesus made the point, the tax collector went to his house justified because his repentance was real. The tax collector's attitude was that of being humiliated before the Lord not self-justifying. Let me give you one more example, but in two different parts. Saul, the Pharisee, the persecutor of the church, the enforcer of 
The Sanhedrin council, he's on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians. He's confronted by the Lord Jesus himself. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And Saul, who had become Paul, was blinded. He had to be led by the hand to Damascus. And for the next three days, a blinded Saul didn't eat. He didn't drink. He fasted in the darkness. He was stunned that he had been persecuting God himself. And now this man who would be chosen by God as an apostle, the last chosen apostle, the instrument of God to carry the gospel to the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel, he never forgot his past. He never forgot. Yes, he is the one who wrote the glorious inspired text of Romans 8, 1, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But he also wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, I am the least of the apostles, because I persecuted the church of God. He wrote in Galatians 1.13, You have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. His repentance was massive. It was verifiable. His life was completely different. But 30 years later, Paul demonstrated what a man who repents quickly looks like. I want to finish our time together having you turn with me to Acts 23. Acts 23, Paul records, Acts 23 rather, records Paul being arrested and brought before the Jerusalem council. Very, very difficult situation. Very, very unjust Acts 23, verse 1. Now Paul, looking intently at the Sanhedrin, said, Brothers, I have lived my life in all good conscience before God up to this day. He's been a believer for 30 years or so by now. And the high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? Paul is absolutely correct to be indignant at being treated as a condemned man when no trial has been performed. And yet, verse 4, But those standing nearby said, Do you revile the high priest of God? And Paul said, I was not aware, brothers, that he was high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. This is phenomenal. Here he is, this high priest who is a desperately wicked man. And yet Paul knows he has violated the scriptures. And he immediately quotes the scripture that he's violated and offers his humble repentance to those who hate him. Why? Because his repentance wasn't about those who were opposing him. It was about the fact that he had violated God's standards and that grieved him. And he immediately repented even after he had wrongly been struck. And I want you to notice something. He took responsibility for his part and he didn't even reference the fact that he had been struck. He didn't use it as an excuse for sin. So, can you hold bitterness and hatred in your heart? No. No. Are you to extend forgiveness, the restoration of relationship immediately upon repentance? Yes. Can you make a decision to simply show grace? Absolutely, with wisdom and discernment. Can you be compelled to forgive, to restore a relationship without the presence of repentance? No, you can't. Is there any other basis for forgiveness other than repentance? No. What does this have to do with the power of grace in prayer? And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Listen. It's in prayer that the power and the strength to obey is found. It's in prayer that the power to even hold yourself accountable to God. And let's make this personal. Father, would you forgive me of my sins even as I just forgave this guy and that woman and my wife and my husband a minute ago or an hour ago? It is accountability built in. But it's in prayer that you say, Lord, 
I would, in my own idolatrous heart, I would elevate myself above you. I would be more righteous than you. I would say, I can't forgive you because you're an unrighteous person. But it's in prayer that I find the strength and the grace to decrease myself, to lower myself, to say I have no right to place myself as being higher than God. That I graciously forgive just as God in Christ has graciously forgiven me. The power of grace in prayer listen carefully, says that the gospel has so permeated your own life that you wouldn't dare hold bitterness and resentment in your heart, particularly when asking the Lord to forgive you of your daily sins. The grace of God to you compels your grace toward others. And and listen, this is a blunt reminder in prayer, an obvious prompt to genuinely check your own heart toward others as you seek this unfeathered, beautiful communion with God. My hope for us as a church is that the grace that you show to those around you reflects the overwhelming eternal grace based in repentance that God has shown you in Christ. May we reflect the graciousness of God. Amen? Let's pray together. Our Father, we come to you now appropriately having been Speaking of your grace, we don't deserve to be forgiven. It was only your kindness that ever even brought us to the point of repentance in the first place. And so, Father, we ask you to remind us that in prayer, when we ask for your forgiveness, that we state back to you the standard you have given, just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. May the members of Grace Bible Church be characterized, yes, by standing for the truth, yes, by having a proper understanding of forgiveness and repentance. But may we be characterized as those who are gracious, who are kind. And when someone genuinely repents, we we rush to forgive. We, We rush to give grace. We rush to restore. We are quick about that business. And now, Lord, in really the ultimate reminder of your grace to us, we come to you before the Lord's table and we ask you, Lord, to be with us now in a very special way as we remember the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.